thinking about everything that Jesus has done and how he came, sacrificed his life, lived perfectly, and he did that all for us. I don't have a very long service um, planned, although it gets longer sometimes. <laughs> Remembering why Jesus had to come and why it had to be him and it could be no one else. I, I worked a minute ago. <laughs> well, sometimes I just want to throw it away, but I won't. <laughs> Jesus was called a man of sorrows. This is taken from Isaiah 53. This was predicted long before Jesus came, that there would be a Messiah who came and that he wouldn't just be this reigning hero. Of course, we know when he comes again, he will be coming to take us home and he will be the uncontested winner. But there had to be a sacrifice for our sin because the sins of blood and the blood of sheep and goats was not enough to remove our sin and to change our hearts. The law was not enough to make us obey the law. Boy, it would be easy if you just made a law and everybody obeyed it. But our hearts, because we were created in God's image and we were created perfect, but we went off road and we decided to do things our own way and we were disobedient and that changed us at the very core, us and everyone who comes from us, meaning our children. All the way from Adam and Eve, we all have a sin nature, the propensity to be rebellious, to rebel against authority, to want to do what we want to do. And if Jesus didn't come and die in our place, we would have to pay for our own sin, which is an eternity separated from God. But because he came and because he suffered and died and he was the perfect lamb of God, we now have an opportunity for redemption. More on that on Sunday. But a man of sorrows, he was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray and have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Imagine punishing the innocent for the guilty. You know how it is when you turn the TV on and you look at the war between Russia and the Ukraine and you feel so bad for the Ukraine, punished and dying for nothing that they did heaps of bodies being found. And you say, this is just wrong. These innocent people are dying so a, a megalomaniac can take property. Something in us resonates. The righteousness of God is that the wicked should get punished for their wickedness and the good people should get rewarded for their goodness. But in God's economy, he couldn't have that or none of us would be reconciled to him. And so God puts all of his righteousness in his only son as he comes and he dies for us. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. If you're anything like me, I try to avoid grief. I try to avoid sorrow. I like comfortable things. I like large meals. <laughs> I like lazy boys. I like having the remote as I have the lazy boy. But Jesus embraced grief and sorrow and seemed to find the people that were grieving and sorrowful was attracted to them so that he might give them something that they needed. And he understood it because he went through the most horrific death that anybody could go through. And he knew it was coming. Unlike you and I, he knew the day and he knew the method and he knew when, and he prepared his whole life for it. Good example for us. 
even as they were approaching Jerusalem, Jesus is quoted here in John chapter 12. But Jesus answered them saying, the hour has come that the son of man should be glorified. He's speaking of himself. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. And he who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. In other words, let him do what I do. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. Jesus speaks of a seed falling to the ground, getting completely dried out, devoid of any life whatsoever. And yet you put it in the ground and get some moisture to cover it and get some warmth on it. And it suddenly life comes from this little teeny seed and it knows exactly how to build a stalk of grain, exactly how to make all of this grain on the head with everything. It, it, the seed knows all by itself, just like you and I are put together from a little map called DNA. And God programmed that so that you would be exactly who you are. Maybe not the bad choice part but the possibility part. And God has created all of that. And Jesus is saying, it's like, I'm going to die, but don't worry about it. There will be fruit that comes after this. And Jesus knows this and he's teaching them beforehand. So after he dies, they start getting it and they start writing it all down. But they didn't know when he spoke it. You and I do. We have the benefit of looking back. Hindsight's always 20-20. Hebrews 2.9 says, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned him with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. The scripture teaches, not only by the words of Jesus, but, but the, also the apostles that come after, that Jesus came to die in our place, the substitutionary death of an innocent for the guilty. And because he was God, the son, he had authority to do that. In fact, we're going to see his authority in the book of Revelation. When there's the title deed of the earth and they search for somebody who's worthy to open the seals and there's none in heaven who are worthy to open it except for one. It's Jesus himself who has the right to open the title deed to the earth because he purchased it with his very blood. Jesus says later in John 12, now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Therefore, the people who stood by and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. And Jesus answered and said, this voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all peoples to myself. He said this signifying by what death he would die. It's an interesting thing that a Jew who was accused of being the son of God would get punished by the Romans. The stoning would occur. In fact, they tried to stone him several times when he said, I and the father are one and the same. He called himself equal with God, the father. And it caused these guys to say, you just blaspheme and call yourself God. You being a man, you make yourself God. And he says, well, what's your problem? And then he explained it. Thing is, Jesus had no problem telling people the truth. People had a big problem hearing the truth. And Jesus said, if I'd be lifted up on a cross, he knew exactly how he was going to die. He knew it wouldn't be by stoning. It wouldn't be by a train wreck. It wouldn't be by falling in a well. It wouldn't be any of those things. He knew exactly when and how it would happen. And he said, if I get lifted up on a cross and I die, I will bring all men to myself. It reminds me of John chapter three, when Jesus calls himself a serpent. 
In the Old Testament in Numbers, there's this wonderful thing of when the called people of God not only get out of the reach of Egypt, but they go through the Red Sea and they get to the other side, except instead of taking a direct route to the promised land, the Lord puts them out in a desert, as he does all of us, to learn a few things. And suddenly all these serpents came up and were biting people and they were dying. There were poisonous vipers out in the, and it was God's judgment on them. He told Moses, Moses, make a stick, make a staff, and then want you to make a brazen serpent out of bronze, make this thing and put it up on a pole and stick it in the ground. So everybody that looks to this pole, if they get bitten, they won't die, which sounds ridiculous. I'd rather have somebody with a sharp knife and a, and a good pair of lips to suck that junk out of there. <laughs> but those who were bitten by the vipers died, and those who got bitten by the vipers and looked to the serpent lived. And you say, that's some weird mumbo jumbo. Jesus, he who knew no sin, became sin, the symbol of the snake, for us, that we would be justified. Jesus got put on a wooden stake and he was staked out. And it's by faith in him alone that we will be saved from the bite of sin. Amen. Amen. That is why Jesus came. And that's why it's so incredibly important. Of course, I want to rush right to Sunday, (laughs) but it's important to know the cost of what it costs to buy me back, to buy you back. In John 17, Jesus spoke these words and he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that your son also may glorify you. Jesus spoke of his death in terms of glorifying God. Not the end, not a horrible, terrible tragedy, but in a victory. As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. We get a little glimpse of Jesus's eternal character that he always was. He is the alpha and omega. He is the beginning and the end. And he was with God in the beginning. The uh, first chapter of John explains that very, very well. Jesus is God imprisoned in a man's body to live out his life as a sacrificial lamb for you. It's a tremendous bit of good news. And no wonder we don't tell the whole world. Why would we let people perish when they can be saved? And they don't have to live in, in bondage to their own addiction to sin. So Jesus says, glorify me with the glory that I once had with you before the world was. This is before creation because he is the creator. And you guys know the story of Jesus on that night when he was betrayed. He had what we call the last supper with his disciples. It was the Passover meal as they broke bread and as they drank. And Jesus said, I won't ever do this again until I see you again in heaven. This is truly Jesus's last meal. And he knows it and he wants it to count. And he says, I have looked forward to this with joy to share this meal with you. He's on the edge of his death and he's saying, it's a joy to be here with you. He does that. And he says, one of you is going to betray me. And they all have an argument over who's going to do it and who's not going to do it. And is it me, Lord? Is it me? Is it, it's not me. And all of this rabble, you know, 12 guys. You should come to men's breakfast. And they all have this. And the only one that thinks to ask Jesus instead of defending themselves or accusing one another is John, who's a teenager. He leans back against Jesus's breast and he says, Lord, who is it's going to betray you? He says, it's the one who's going to dip into the cup with me at the same time. He goes to dip into the cup. They dip the bread in the wine and that's how they ate it. And it's the, immediately two hands were in the cup and it was Judas Iscariot. 
And he looked at him in the midst of all of this arguing and said, go do what you must do quickly. And it says at that moment, Satan entered him. And he turned around and he left. And Jesus had a long conversation with the rest of the disciples when he was gone. And he knew he was going to get betrayed. Everyone else said, where's Judas going? Ah, maybe we're running short on wine or maybe we're running short on something. Because he's the guy that carried the money. A trusted follower of Jesus. And Jesus let him handle the money. You want to talk about the grace of God. What does he let you handle? So, of course, you know, after dinner, he takes off his outer vesture and he's basically down to his underwear and he goes and he pours a basin of water and he goes around and washes the disciples' feet. That's usually something you do before eating because the tables were low and somebody's feet was always, always in your face and you don't know what they've been walking in. Nobody did it, but Jesus did. And he goes around and he washes all of their feet. He comes to Peter and Peter says, no way, you're not going to wash my feet. I feel that way sometimes. Lord, you're not going to do that for me. That's a, that's a low position. That's the lowest slave position. You know, I'm not going to let you do that. Who the heck would I be to let you do that? He says, you don't understand. If I don't wash your feet, then you have no part in me. And he says, okay, in Peter's fashion, I want a bath from head to toe. I want to, I'm in. And he said, calm down, Peter. You just don't, your whole body doesn't need to be washed, just your feet. And you are all clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. It's rather interesting. Judas is gone. And he's speaking to his disciples. Washes their feet and he gets up. He wipes himself up and he puts a towel aside. He puts on his outer vestry. He goes, you know what I've done for you? He says, you call me Lord and Savior. And so I am. If I, your Lord and Savior, wash your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. Can you do that? I sure hope you can. So Jesus goes to the garden with his disciples. They sing the Psalms and they get there and they spend the night and Jesus separates himself with three of the disciples and prays. And we're told what his prayer is before the three closest ones who are near him doze off. Father, if this cup can pass from me, but not my will, thy will be done. And the disciples fall asleep. The three closest guys as generals. <laughs> Jesus goes and wakes them up. He says, couldn't you, couldn't you pray with me an hour? He says, stay up. Come on, guys. He goes back and he prays the same prayer again because they heard at least the beginning part of it again. And then they fall asleep again. This happens three times. Peter had to be there because everything's in threes with him. And finally, Jesus goes back the third time. He goes, go ahead, sleep, guys. My betrayer's here. And they turn around and they see an army of soldiers coming with Judas at the head and a couple of religious leaders. They come into the garden to take him. They step up to Jesus and say, Jesus said, who, who are you looking for? It's interesting. Jesus asked them, who are you looking for? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. He says, I am. And they all fell back, all tripped over each other, their torches and everything. And finally they get back up and he, he says, who are you looking for? <laughs> and they say, Jesus of Nazareth. And at some point, Judas comes up and kisses him. And Jesus says, do you betray the son of man with a kiss? Peter, thinking he had to save Jesus, pulls out a sword, tries to hack off a head and only gets an ear. And he tells Peter, put your sword away. Because if you're going to live by the sword, you're going to die by the sword. So he puts it away and he picks up the guy's ear and heals him right there in front of everyone. Can you imagine being the guy who lost his ear and got it back? It'd be an instant convert. And Jesus said, you said you're looking for me, so take me. Let these go since you're looking for me. 
And he did exactly that. He gave himself into their hands and they took him. And his disciples didn't know what to do. The one that they had been following for three and a half years, he was gone. He was taken into custody. The first place they took him was to the house of Annas. Annas was the high priest. And by the way, when you're a high priest, you're a high priest forever. You don't get changed out. But when the Romans came in, they got, he got them mad. And so they said, no, you're not high priest anymore. We're going to get your son-in-law Caiaphas. He'll, he'll be the high priest. And so they installed him because he was more politically connected and he would do whatever the Romans told him to do. But they understood the power behind the high priest. And that was Annas. They went to his house at night. By Jewish law, you're not to have court at night. You're not to have it in someone's house. And the death penalty was not to be administered until at least two days of hearing witnesses. None of this was followed. They go to Annas' house. They wake him up. And we hear that he questioned him about how many disciples he had and what he taught. Undoubtedly wanting to go and round them all up. When they were done, they sent him to Caiaphas, the high priest. And of course, by now it's daytime. He told Peter at the last supper, Peter said, oh, I'm never going to leave you, Lord, all these. And he said, listen, by the time the cock crows, by the time morning comes and you hear a rooster, you will have denied me three times. And it's at this point when he denies him a third time and Jesus turns and looks at him, not with a grudge, but with love. And Peter runs away weeping. So the great Peter has fallen and Jesus was right with his prediction. After he saw Annas, he saw Caiaphas. And we see Jesus get struck for the first time. Then he goes to Pilate. Pilate, who was sent there by the Romans to make sure he kept peace, but he had two strikes against him. He had already done two really bad things that got the Romans angry at him. Uh, he set up an eagle and there was, there were some things that he did and the Jews were mad at him because they thought that he broached their law, which anything you do broaches their law. And so he had to play nice and make politics. So he questions Jesus and he says, so you're a king because now they're coming to him and saying he claims to be like Caesar, which is not what Jesus said. And he says, well, I'm a king. Yeah but this isn't, this isn't my kingdom. If it was, my fathers would fight for me, but they don't because my kingdom's of heaven. Then he says, I don't see anything wrong with this guy. This is a religious thing. You, you religious people take care of it. So they send him away and they send him to Herod. Oh, he's a Nazarene. Okay, cool. Not my jurisdiction. Cool. I don't have to deal with this. Send him to the next guy, the 50 yard buck pass. Send him to the next guy. Sends him to Herod. Herod wanted to see him for quite some time. And he was hoping that he would see him do a miracle, but Jesus didn't say a word to him, not a word. Because he wanted to see the flash of the Messiah do a miracle. And so he ends up sending him back to Pilate. Pilate sees him. He says, Eki homo, behold the man before the Jews. This is your king. You want me to crucify your king? You want me to kill your king? Are you kidding me? And they said, we have no king but Caesar. You want to talk about blasphemy. So what he does is he takes him back and he has him flogged with what's called a cat of nine tails, which has bits of bone and shards of ceramic and metal. And he's whipped and flayed until he has no flesh left on his back. There are people that die from such a thing because their internal organs fall out because there's nothing left to hold them in. Jesus endures this. They put on a purple robe and they press a thorn of crowns, much like what you see here on his head. And they send him out before the people. And he says, here's your king. And they said, no, we, we don't want him released. He goes, well, listen, it's the time of the year. It's the Passover. I release somebody to you. Why not your king? Now that I beat him to a pulp, aren't you satisfied? And no, they weren't. They said, give us Barabbas. Barabbas was a known insurrectionist. He had committed murder multiple times. He got busted and thrown in jail. And the people, even the, especially the religious people, 
beckon for a murderer over Jesus, who had done nothing but perform miracles and teach. And so they did. They released Barabbas. And then Pilate took him back and said, listen, I don't find anything wrong with this guy. And he says, I, and he went out and he washed his hands in front of the people. He says, I don't find anything wrong. There's no, no blood on my hands, guys. Take him and do whatever you want. And that's exactly what they did. They marched him to a cross. They made him carry his cross on type of his raw back. So much so that he stumbled under the weight of it. And they found someone in the crowd. The Romans ordered, them, ordered him to get under there with him and carry the cross all the way to Calvary. And you know the story as Jesus hung on a cross between two thieves. The two thieves have a conversation back and forth and they mock him. But in the midst of all of this and the people standing there and jeering and speaking against Jesus because he's in the middle and he's the big show. One of the men has a change of heart. And he says, listen, you got to lay off him. We're, we deserve what we get. But he's done nothing wrong. He realizes that Jesus is innocent. And he says to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He knew enough to say that. And then by showing that, he showed faith in the things that Jesus said and who he was. And without being baptized, without being a member of a church, without doing one good thing, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. It is by simple faith in the work and person of Jesus Christ that we're saved. Amen? Amen. Jesus suffered through his anticipation of torture and death. He knew it was coming. He even said, what am I going to say, Lord? Take this away from me? Because for this very reason I'm here. And yet, when he's in the garden, what's he say? if this cup could pass for me. You know what it is when a tragic thing is going to happen and you don't look forward to it and you're just overcome with fear? Jesus didn't have that. He didn't have that. He talked about it freely. He tried to prep his disciples. He tried to make sure that they were all ready for it. You didn't see him dreading it. Oh, I don't want to go to Jerusalem. I know what's going to happen. He didn't do any of that. He marches into it willingly. But there's this weight a constant anticipation of this torture that Jesus had to endure. That was part of what he endured. His innocence in the control of the guilty. I, I don't know about you, but when I'm in an argument and I know I'm right, there's no way I'm going to let you get away with being wrong. And Jesus was right. And he let those who are wrong get away with it. Willingly. Like a sheep before her shears is silent, and so he opened not his mouth. He didn't defend himself, because there was nothing he could say. It was destined to happen. The hypocrisy of releasing a murderer instead of him. Can you imagine being up and saying, who do you, you know, who do you want to be, <laughs> who do you want to be pastor of your church? Here's a three-month-old infant and Pastor Dave. <laughs> and you say the three-month-old infant. I, Except this is way worse. This is God the Son next to a murderous man. And they chose him. Can you think of a, a person who's endured greater indignity than Jesus? And he did it for you. All of it. So that none of us could say, well, God doesn't understand. He doesn't know. No, he knows. You want to talk about your parenting, your, your parentage being in question as to whether you were legitimately born? He had that with a single mom who was Mary in his adult life. And they always questioned his heritage. Jesus has been through it all. His death by the humiliation of crucifixion. You see the pictures of crucifixion and it's, it's kind of doctored up. He was naked. Naked. I, I have dreams about being naked in public. And Jesus was hung on a cross, pierced and hung on a cross 
to die by drowning. Essentially, your lungs fill with fluid and you can't breathe. And that's how you die by suffocation. And Jesus did that for you so that you wouldn't spend an eternity separated from God. His betrayal by a trusted friend, the guy who let hold the money, betrayed him for silver. And he, he was so humiliated after Jesus got turned in. He says, I have betrayed innocent blood. And he took the 30 pieces of silver and threw it into the temple. And he went out and he hung himself. That's remorse, but that's not repentance. He was abandoned by his closest followers. All of his disciples scattered and they were gone. The denial of his strongest leader, who's Peter, denied him three times. Jesus told him he would. Peter, the guy said, I'll never, Lord, I'll, I'll be willing to die for you. He wasn't even willing to admit he knew him. You know what it's like when somebody betrays you, someone's close to you? Jesus knows that. Being subjugated by an invading Roman Empire. He was a Jew being looked down and hated by a bunch of people that didn't belong there. They came in and took over their territory. And Jesus submitted himself to that. He had the unbelief of a, of a ruthless tyrant. You know, it's like when somebody doesn't believe what you're saying. I hate that. But imagine somebody like Pilate who's playing political chess and he doesn't believe. He was killed by religious rulers because of envy, because they had positions of power and they didn't want to share it with Jesus and Jesus intimidated them. Have you ever felt like somebody was intimidated by you and they just cut you up and they hated you for it? Jesus knows that. His life and his ministry were cut short in the prime of his life. He's 33 years old. That's pretty much the prime. That's when you know enough to stay out of trouble. <laughs> and you still have your youth. He was cut off in the middle of his prime. Not being heard or understood by those who he showed love to. Everybody that he spoke to, it seemed like nobody understood. There were a few. Mary, who would come down and weep on his feet and pour ointment on him. She knew he was dying. And Jesus said, she's doing this because she's preparing for my burial. Getting me to smell good. So after I come down from the cross, I'm not totally abhorrent to the people that take my dead body. Concluding his mission in apparent failure, it seems like Jesus was doing well in developing followers and he goes into Jerusalem. He could have just taken the throne and yet he didn't. And it, people criticized what Jesus did and think it was a failure. It wasn't a failure. That's the very thing he came to do. He was bearing the punishment for those who killed him. From the cross, as he looked down, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. As they nailed him to the cross, Father, forgive them. Forgive Quintus, who's nailing me here. They don't know what they're doing. Forgive the high priests who yell out. Forgive these people who hate my guts and spit at me and jeer at me and beat me. God, forgive them. What a heart. Wearing the sin of the world, having never sinned himself. Jesus being very God, never sinned. And yet he had to bear sin as though he did. You know what it is, that deep shame and that deep pain in your heart when you've failed your own self? Jesus had to bear that having not done anything wrong because he had to take your sin. And of course, he was separated from the Father as well as his rightful home in heaven. Father wouldn't look upon him because he had sin. You guys know the story of when Jesus came and why he came. Jesus did this all in the hope of purchasing some of us from our sin and shame for a relationship of love with him. We can never hope to be worthy of this offer, but we are called to receive this free gift purchased for us by his own blood. It's no wonder that people will stand before God in accountability for what they do with Jesus. 
and nothing else matters. You might be a murderer, you might be a thief, you might be any number of assorted sins. Welcome to the club. Jesus delivers us not only from the shame of it, but also the power of it, that it no longer controls us. Because when he calls you free, you're free indeed. Amen? Amen. Because Jesus took your sin. Jesus faced pain and rejection and death, and he did all of that for us. We should be a thankful people. And whatever it is you think that you're suffering or going through or are having difficulty with, just know that Jesus understands exactly what you went through and then some. That's why Good Friday is important or Black Friday or Dark Friday. I think we should change these names. Come back on Sunday because the good news is that death could not hold him because he was the one who purchased life.